Hello and welcome to the Hormones in Harmony podcast. I'm your host, Vivian Allred, naturopathic nutritional therapist and hormone enthusiast. If you want to learn how to rebalance your female hormones, regulate your menstrual cycle and reclaim your vitality, then you are in the right place. Each week I will be delving into different conditions such as PCOS, endometriosis, infertility, hypothyroidism, acne and hair loss. Stay tuned for interviews with expert guests, Q&As and solo episodes that are all intended to help you move from hormonal chaos to hormonal harmony. If you'd like to submit a question for me to answer on the podcast, then you can email them to hormonesinharmony at gmail.com. The information shared on this podcast is intended for educational purposes only and is not designed to replace the advice of your health practitioner. That said, let's get into today's episode. Hi everyone, welcome to episode number six and today I'm joined by Sarah K. Hoffman. Sarah is the founder of A Gutsy Girl and the creator of The Gutsy Girl's Bible, which is an approach to healing the gut. She's a certified health coach from the Institute for Integrative Nutrition and she's also a wellness expert specialising in food allergies, intolerances, gut health and women's health issues. She's so passionate about gut health and helping other women because she doesn't want them to have to walk through this path alone. She lives in southern Minnesota with her husband and three children. And you can find her online on Instagram, Pinterest and Facebook and also the Gutsy Girl blog. And I'm going to link all of those things in the show notes for you to check out. In this episode, we discuss Sarah's journey with digestive health issues, including the mistakes that she made along the way when trying to heal her gut and how to avoid them. We also talk about how to know if your gut's healthy because we hear this term all the time about gut health but what are the signs and symptoms of a healthy gut and how can we achieve that. We also discuss the different diets recommended for digestive issues and there isn't a one size fits all so Sarah goes into how to identify maybe what you're dealing with and some of the suitable diets that have been used with success. And we also touch on something really important, which is the mental and emotional aspects of health and why that is so crucial when it comes to gut health specifically. So hi, Sarah. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this with me. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to talk to you today. Me too. So you're going to be the first guest I have on to talk all about gut health and It's such an important subject, in my opinion, relating to hormones, but they often go alongside each other, I find. So women with PCOS or endometriosis often have an underlying gut imbalance, maybe intestinal permeability, all of these things. So we're going to be discussing how you got into kind of the nutrition world, how you overcame your gut health problems and kind of your story. Could you just start off by sharing a bit about that with the people listening? Yeah, so my story is actually fairly long, so I will kind of do the short version of it um, because otherwise it would probably take the whole the whole time here. Um, But yeah, I mean, to your point, I think this is it's something that you said that's really great is that how you know the gut and hormones and fertility and all of that go together because that's really truly my story. Um, A gutsy girl started in two thousand and nine. I had been dealing with a lot of Um, stomach issues in 2005, I think I was, or seven or eight, something like that. I can't remember. It's been so long now. I was diagnosed with colitis, but it wasn't until um, later on when a gutsy girl kind of really emerged. And it's, it was right after a very long and brutal cycle of going through IVF. And in the end, what happened was our IVF failed and I just kind of had this complete, you know, like realization and turning of my life around. And that's kind of when my story begins. So, um, I, like I said, I was originally diagnosed with colitis and I had stomach issues. They pretty much started when I was a freshman in college. So that would have been around 2005. And, um, I was just like miserably sick. My stomach always hurt. Uh, if for anyone that has any kind of gut issues, I think you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about here. But I, I always say that I'm so grateful that I had my own um, college dorm room that year because I could literally, like without hearing a single sound, I could smell up the entire room because my stomach was in so much like 
pain and there was just so much going on that everything that came out of me was just so like gross, you know? Um, so that's kind of when I first realized that something was going on, but it wasn't until then, um, my junior year in college, I was chronically ill the entire year. I had pharyngitis, I had um, tonsillitis, I had strep throat, everything for a year straight, and I went on antibiotics every single month that year. And towards the end of that year, then the doctor said that I had to have my tonsils removed because, because I had been so ill and wasn't getting better. So I had my tonsils removed. And shortly after I had my tonsils removed, then like, in Keep in mind at this point in my life, I didn't care about food. I mean, the only thing I really cared about as far as like being quote unquote healthy was if it was like fat free, sugar free, and I didn't, nothing else really mattered to me. And so um, I remember I was driving back after my tonsillectomy from my hometown, which is where we live now, up to Minneapolis, which is about an hour from my hometown. And I remember it felt like, something was like tugging on the side of my mouth. Like something was pulling my tongue to the side of my mouth and like scraping. So I had this weird feeling and it never went away. It kept on, kept on. And eventually towards the end of my senior year of college, I went to a dentist who saw no signs of thrush in my mouth, which is, a, which is thrush is very common with like a candida overgrowth or he thought that's what probably was going on, but there was no visible signs of it. So without having any visible signs and nothing really to base his diagnosis off of, he gave me Nystatin, which is another medication. And I took it and I actually got worse. And so when I went back to him, we, I stopped that and, and it was, you know, even though he gave me that, it was him who was the first person to ever say, maybe you're just intolerant to some kind, some kind of food. And it was really the first time this light bulb ever went off in my head, like, oh my gosh, maybe, maybe there is something to this whole idea that food is making me sick, really sick. Um, but again, at this point, all I really cared about was staying thin and, you know, like eating fat-free, sugar-free, everything. So I kept on and I kept getting worse. Um, and I just kept on this path until I finally had my first colonoscopy and endoscopy in uh, 2000, like I said at the beginning, like I think it was like 2007, 2008, and I was diagnosed with colitis. And after I was diagnosed with colitis, they gave me canasa, which is a suppository. And I just took it, not just took it, not really thinking much about it. And it didn't make me better. In fact, it made me worse. And so then I eventually said that there has to be more to this. There has to be more to healing and to getting better than just medication and living like this. And so I really just started my journey for true gut healing. And the weird thing is by that point, um, I had done so much more damage because of all of the years of the medications and the antibiotics and the um, the yo-yo dieting and the overworking out and the so I didn't know it at that time but I would be I would start a journey basically towards this like real gut healing but it would involve a lot of heartache with the infertility and with getting diagnosed with SIBO and everything else right and what were your first steps obviously you had a lot going on so the colitis and the medication and all of the antibiotics you took what were the first steps? It can be quite overwhelming. Where did totally. you start off with? Did you start off with the diet or did you go yeah. straight into testing, other functional testing, things like that? Well, at that point, I thought that my testing was done. I thought, okay, I have colitis. This is what I'm working with. And so what I did is I started working with a nutritionist. And working with her, it was great. You know, I started, I did start to learn stuff, but the problem was I actually didn't feel any better. So the way that she had me eating was very, you know, quote unquote clean. I was eating a lot of fruits and vegetables and grains. And, um, you know, I, I cut out like, you know, dairy, wheat, gluten, all the like normal suspecting things, but I still just really wasn't making that much progress. 
And one day while I was working with her, I stumbled upon the GAPS diet. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Yep. Yeah, most people are, but it stands for gut and psychology syndrome. And it basically was opposite, everything opposite of what we had been doing. It's like really emphasizes that, you know, no grains, no gluten, obviously, um, a lot more meat, a lot more fat, a lot more um, like very careful with like fruits and vegetables and things like that. And so, oh, and also it really focuses a lot on bone broth. And I just remember the night before I started that, I just told myself, like, we're just going to try this and see, because I knew that nothing would change if nothing would change. And this was something that was complete opposite of what I like believed and thought to believe and thought was healthy my entire life. So it wasn't but a week later and pretty much seemingly overnight, all my symptoms had gone away. And that's when we started to realize maybe there was something more than the colitis going on. Maybe the approach for, that's, it's really when I started to believe that um, maybe the approach for healing the gut is so individual. It's so, every person is so different. And the way that we heal is not like, there's not, there's no such thing as a one size fits all. And at, it was at that point then that I decided to go back to school as well to study so that I could help myself, but then ultimately that I would be able to help other women on their journeys at some point. Yeah, the GAPS diet is really restrictive and it is like a therapeutic diet. So how long did you kind of do that for? Was it the like couple of months or was it a good few years that you were on that? So Dr. Natasha says that like mild cases, you know, like you could follow up for like maybe a couple months and then like pretty severe cases. I think it's like a year to three years or something like that. Yeah. My case was, you know, fairly, fairly complex. However, in hindsight, if I had to do it again, and when I talk about this, I have always like very careful to talk about the fact that I don't believe that I should have done it for as long as I did, because I do think that it contributed to more of my hormonal problems because I stayed for such a long time on, you know, a lot of like barely any carbohydrates and I was still working out. Um, so I probably stayed on it for at least a good six, seven months, like a very, very, like, you know, there's several stages to it. Um, and I stayed within the first few stages for several months. So, but I mean, you know, so like on the one hand, I, my stomach felt so great and I felt like, you know, I never had before in my entire life. It was like I had gotten this new lease on life, but the problem was it, I stayed on it too long and I didn't know how to reintroduce things and I didn't do that appropriately. So the answer to that really is like, if you have to do the GAPS diet, just be very cautious and very like careful with how long you stay in those intro phases. Yeah, I was going to ask you, like, what are the kind of mistakes that you've made along the way? Definitely with the GAPS diet, it can be quite restrictive, like I said, and then the more you restrict, the harder it is to reintroduce things, especially if you do it for a long period of time. Are there other kind of mistakes that you've made along the way in your health journey that you want people to kind of avoid? I've made so many mistakes and that's, that's partly like why this is like my mission is because I don't want people to have to take, I don't want it to take 10 years. Like it took me, you know, to go from awfully miserable to like completely incredible where I'm at today. Um, another really big mistake that I made and that I think people make in general is they get so excited about like the latest diet or trend or supplements and they're trying to do so many, and I did the same thing. I, I tried to do so many things at once that if something didn't work, I didn't really know what it was. And on the flip side, if something did work, I also didn't really know what it was. Um, I'm working on a blog post right now, just really trying to help people with like a minimalist style in supplements, because I know that everybody out there, you know, like things you have to take, like, I mean, at one point I felt like I was an entire medicine cabinet filled with supplements and like it was a part-time job to keep up with this stuff. And I look back and I'm like, but was that really necessary? Like I can honestly tell you today, there's like a few that I'm like religious to. And I, I know like in the beginning of the healing journey, you probably do need more than that. I mean, obviously you should work with your doctor on that, but, but I, it's just, I think it was too much and it became too much. And when something becomes too much, we're much less likely to stick with it. And that's what happened to me. So that's one thing. Um, I also think, you know, just like getting caught up in like what the, 
latest diet or the gut health trend is because it just doesn't work for everyone. And so like a perfect example of that would be probiotics. So for, you know, for the longest time and for people in general, the healthy population, a probiotic is fantastic. It's great. If you find yourself a good probiotic, I totally recommend it. However, if you have SIBO or you have other things like certain strains aren't for you, or maybe a probiotic isn't going to be for you at all. And I didn't know that. And so here is me totally miserable with SIBO and still taking these like heavy duty probiotics and feeling miserable. And I didn't understand why. And that's why is because not everything that's like quote unquote gut healthy is gut healthy for you. Um, so that's another big mistake I made. Um, and then I think the final thing that I just caution women on in particular is really trying to n not restrict, like try to like push your limits. Like if something says that you can like, for instance, in the low FODMAP diet, if something says you could have up to 10 nuts, but you can't have 20, then I think you should have 10 and you should not have 20. You should not have none because you think that's going to be better. It's not, it really is not. And it sets you up for this vicious cycle. Meanwhile, I also think that I worked out way too much during my healing journey. And I would caution that for any woman that I work with. I, I hear women, I work with women all the time or they send me messages, you know, that they're, they can't figure out why their stomach is so miserable and they, they, eat right and they work out five to six days a week hard. And I'm like, that could probably be it. Because I can tell you that every single time I started training for a hard race or, I mean, even just like doing anything intense five, six days a week, I was miserable. And I learned my lesson over and over and over until finally this past year, I just gave, gave into it. And it's been the most incredible thing. Yeah, I think I've probably um, made the same exact same mistakes as you. And I find that they're just so common, aren't they? You can do, just fall into the trap of following what you read online. And it's a good thing in some ways that we've got blogs like your own and all these different health articles and websites to kind of provide us with information for free. However, we can't just take what we read online and implement it into our own health because like when you was mentioning about the probiotics, I have a histamine intolerance. So certain things don't work for me. And at the start of my health journey, I was kind of pounding the kombucha and the sauerkraut and mm -hmm. thinking that I was eating really healthily. And my scalp was on fire itching. My anxiety was through the roof. My acne was terrible. And I was like, oh, I'm just detoxing. It's just like the Herxheimer reaction. <laughs> It'll pass. But it was really inflaming my body and same with probiotic supplements i thought when i started to read about histamine and maybe the connection i turned to probiotics instead but then again there's strains that promote histamine as well so it is so individual and yeah there's just so many things that could be going on in the body and you can get carried away taking all the supplements that you read on a blog post and that you see in the health food store that you think will work and Again, if you've got gut issues anyway, you might not even be absorbing or digesting the, the 40 supplements that you're taking. Yeah, you said so many things that are so important. Um, but that's why, like, you know, I, I think it's my responsibility as having uh, such a blog that's focused on women and gut health now that I do not and that I absolutely say no to brands that I would not take myself and that I do not like a thousand percent trust because like you said, people come to my blog and they like take everything that I say, you know, and they're going to apply it for their own journey. And, you know, that's why like I, I do so much research now and I devote so much time to like writing about all different types of things. Like you mentioned histamine. So I just wrote a blog post all about histamine intolerance, you know, and like the foods and everything, because I, you know, some people that's their thing. And then you should know, like, this is what's different about having that than if you have say SIBO or whatever it might be. Um, I just think that it's really important for people to take a very like critical look and at how they're applying things that they read online. Yeah definitely going to check out your blog post. Mm -hmm. I'm just in the research mode at the moment. And I know that there's a few kind of drivers of my histamine intolerance, some like bacterial overgrowth and low stomach acid and 
genetic variants um I, I think i'm doing the right thing but i'll definitely check that out and see if there's any kind of pills of wisdom that you're sharing on there but for the women who aren't sure whether gut health is playing a role in their health issues i know that you mentioned that your symptoms were kind of pain and maybe diarrhea and like foul smelling gas all of those things what other symptoms should women be looking for to know if their gut health impaired well, the thing is, is your gut controls everything about your body. So it's good news and it's also bad news because you could say, oh my gosh, I'm so tired today. And, but then you're, you're going to be like, well, is it my gut or is it, I didn't get enough sleep or is it I'm pregnant? I mean, you know, there could be so many things, that, but that's the thing with the gut, like kind of symptom that you have could, and oftentimes does go back to the gut. So, um, but to answer your question, just, you know, like, as to give some kind of a list. Um, a lot of people will have anxiety. They'll have a lot of brain issues like mental fogginess, um, depression, just like anything that really is like gut and brain. And then I always talk a lot about gut and skin issues. So I had severe perial dermatitis when I was first diagnosed with SIBO. I mean, it was, I have pictures on my blog. It was awful. So, and then I also had cystic back acne. So just like acne in general, if you have like more than normal or just like it's really painful or it's a different kind than just like, you know, the ones here and there that every, you know, everyone seemingly gets, um, that's something to think about. Another thing would be obviously your fertility. Fertility can go hand in hand with uh, your gut health, your energy levels. Uh, you can be extremely fatigued. I remember when, before I was diagnosed with all this stuff, I, my husband would always, like, we knew if I got glutenized because I was like a dead weight. Like, he could barely, like, pick me up because I was just so tired. Um, a lot of joint pain, too, people that have gut issues have. Yeah, so those are some of the main ones. But the thing is, I think about gut issues, too, is so some people are, like, have they're really constipated or some people can't stop going to the bathroom. And those are like very obvious gut issues, but there's so many things outside of just the gut that could be, that could totally be coming back to the gut. And like I said, they probably are coming back to you, the state of your gut. Yeah. I love that you mentioned you went straight for the non digestive signs and symptoms that we would expect. You went straight for the systems outside of the gut, which is really important because we kind of just hear all the time about the constipation, diarrhea, and bloating, and people think that if they don't suffer with those things, that the gut health's fine, they'd have no problems at all. But I love that you've made the connection between the whole entire body and the gut, because it is the center of our health, and if our gut's not happy, then that's just going to spread throughout the body, maybe through the leaky gut issues, or just because it is located in the middle of our body, it can have a knock-on effect on every single system. Yep, exactly. And what would you say are the main causes of poor gut health? And for you personally, it's probably a combination of the antibiotics, like the immune problems, maybe a poor diet. What else could be playing a factor and causing poor gut health? Yeah, all of those. They say, you know, like right from the time you're born is when you're, I mean, it's true, like your gut health, you're like you're either going to kind of start it off good or you're not. So some things that help you start it off good are being born vaginally versus C-section. I was born via C-section, but my mom always says, well, if back in those days, not that I'm that old, but she still says in those days, if you wouldn't have been you, we both may have died. So, I mean, I never like to like, you can never like shame yourself or your mother for that because it is what it is. But that's, that's the truth is if you were born vaginally, you have a, like a leg up. Um, other things that can be so low stomach acid for me, that was my main bottleneck. I have worked on that for years now is getting my stomach acid back to a normal level. So, and um, I have a blog post on agutsygirl.com that tells how you can check your stomach acid at home. And it's just, it's just a, something to do. I, I am pretty good on my low or on my stomach acid now. So it's like, I think it's what's keeping me doing so well. Um, other things. So yeah, the poor diet, the antibiotics and medications, though, I will say, I mean, I, if you need the antibiotics and the medications, I believe you need, you need them, you need to take them. So I, I don't think that we should be shaming around that either. Um, let's see other things. Stress. Stress is a huge, huge, huge one. 
And the thing with stress, everyone thinks that stress is just like, oh my gosh, I have a homework assignment due. I'm stressed type of stress, but it's not stress. Your body does not distinguish the difference between the stress of a super hard workout or the stress of your kids screaming. Your body just knows if you're stressed or if you're not, but stress is a huge, like it's like directly related um, to a lot of gut issues. I'd say those are probably the biggest ones. Um, oh, also the other thing that can really trigger it too is like an illness or surgery. So like a lot of times, uh, like an autoimmune condition will be triggered after a major surgery or after traveling abroad to a country where, you know, something I don't know that gets contaminated. Those are other things that like are known to trigger. Especially like food poisoning too. That's another mm -hmm. big thing. People say that they've developed IBS type symptoms after food poisoning. But going back to your stomach acid issues, why do you think you've had such an issue with like chronically long-term low stomach acid? And why is stomach acid so important for both gut health and just the health of our whole body? Well, stomach acid helps you break down all your food. So like you, you need to have enough stomach acid, namely with high protein meals, which is why when you do the at-home stomach um, acid test with HCL pills, you can only do it with protein. Um, but it just really helps break everything down so that your, your body is able to just like easily process food, you know, goes in and goes out. Um, for me personally, I don't think you can ever really know why you have low stomach acid, but we have basically come to the conclusion that years of under eating and over exercising led to super low stomach acid. Um, it, your body just like at some point, it just like starts to deplete it all. The other thing that um, contributes to low stomach acid is as you age. So most of the people that are listening to this podcast is you're probably not there yet, but as you get older, naturally you produce less stomach acid. Yeah. I think mine personally was a combination of stress because stress kind of shuts down the um, rest and digest mode. So mm -hmm. if we were 10,000 years ago running from a lion, then we wouldn't be, our body wouldn't be focusing on digesting the meal that we just had for lunch. So right. it's kind of that evolutionary process that we kind of not got rid of yet and it is uh, stomach acid is really important to build uh, digest those building blocks that we need to create our hormones to make our liver function to create neurotransmitters and if food's just sitting in your stomach and not being broken down effectively then that's also food for bacteria to kind of thrive on and produce and all this gas that can be leading to your digestive symptoms yeah, because I mean, we do, we want bacteria, you know, like bacteria, it's, it's not the problem that you have like, quote unquote, good or bad bacteria. It's where it's at, how much it's at and how, like, if there's too much in the small intestine, that creates a lot of problems. If there's not enough somewhere that creates problems, it's, you know, and then, yeah. And then um, you had mentioned about the whole fight, fight or flight thing. You know, I've, I've noticed myself. And I've seen it with a lot of women that I have worked with and talked to is that a lot of times low stomach acid coincides with adrenal fatigue, whether or not you believe in that term. Um, it, it's a real thing. And I've, and I've noticed the direct correlation between low stomach acid and that because of the stress levels and because of the, you're just like running yourself into the ground and you just, you have no, nothing left to, to help you. It's just that chronic long-term stress that kind of shuts everything down and your body's maybe diverting energy away from the gut to keep the brain functioning and keep the adrenal glands functioning somewhat. So yeah, definitely I see that all the time, either people with high cortisol and they're in that fight or flight adrenaline mode, they may have issues with acid reflux and um, diarrhea loose stools, whereas someone with low cortisol might not make the response to actually digest food and um, have a bowel movement so it can work both ways and it's kind of a vicious cycle which one do you address first do you address the adrenals before you can heal the gut or do you have to heal the gut so you can heal the adrenals i actually have a thought on that <laughs> um i always say people ask me which which one to address first what to work on first and um, the way that I went about it is, I think, exactly the way that it works the best. And it is 
address the one that is causing you the most problems and is depleting you of the most. Because once you start to heal one thing, it's like a trickle effect. Everything else starts to get better as well. In my case, the biggest issue by far was the SIBO. So we focused on that with everything that I had and naturally everything else started to get better as well. And do you want to just explain what SIBO is for people who don't know, because it's not really um, a condition that's spoken about in conventional kind of medicine. So for those who don't know, um, we just explain what small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is and how you can develop it and maybe some of the symptoms. Yeah. So I, I always forget, oh my gosh, I talk about SIBO like every single day of my life and I forget that it's still not like, I mean, I know a lot of um, conventional medicine is actually starting to diagnose it now, which I think is fantastic. And because people are starting to get answers for years of being plagued with these symptoms that they had no idea what was going on. But like you said, it's small bacterial or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. It's just when you have too much bacteria in the small intestine and your food certain foods then that you eat, they stay there and ferment and they stay there for too long. And what it can do is it can really like rob you of nutrients. One of the most common nutritional deficiencies for SIBO would be B12. So by the time I was diagnosed with SIBO, I was so deficient in it that I had to take injections to my stomach to try to like quick get those stores back up. I was very depleted. Um, but other symptoms of it, so it would be, you know, low B12, low um, B vitamins in general. Uh, fatigue. You So a classic symptom of SIBO is weight loss, but that was not my case. And that's not the case for everyone. A lot of people also gain weight. So you can't really go by that alone. Um, you are typically you're super bloated though, like in a very uncomfortable way. I remember one time in college, this is, you know, years before I was diagnosed with it. I remember just complaining about how bloated I was and I'd have my college roommate say, oh my gosh, I know what that's like. Cause you know, when you kind of get your period, it's the same <laughs> thing. I was like, it is not the same thing. I mean, this is like, it's, it's a, it's not the same feeling. It's completely different. And you would definitely know the difference between them. It is like an awful, like I always say it's like gremlins pushing against your pants because it's just so awful. Um, and there's a blog post on a gutsy girl called um, unbutton those pants because it addresses <laughs> that time of my life when I was just in so much misery. But SIBO also people that have it, they, like I mentioned, they can't, um, tolerate a classification of foods called low FOD or called FODMAP foods. Um, and these are like the hard part about it is that they're foods that are in general, super healthy for people, you know, they're like onions and apples and garlic. And, and then you get into like different quantities of them or like different pieces of them. Like for instance, broccoli, you can have the heads, but not, you know, it's just like, it's so complicated and so complex, but, but yet, you know, adhering to it or doing the SIBO protocol can, really like I mean it can change your life like it changed my life once I was diagnosed um so those are some of the big symptoms acne again goes with SIBO that I mean that was one of my you know big telling signs um yeah those are rashes in general go along with SIBO a lot of the times and we just like weird things can I mean like pretty much anything can can go along with SIBO. Then the other thing is about SIBO, uh, the way that you're diagnosed with it is with a breath test. Um, I have a whole tutorial on my site too of like how you do that and what that process is like. It's very easy, but you know, there is, it is a process. It's a kind of a 24 hour time, time period of, of a process. Um, and then you're, you know, you're diagnosed with either methane dominant SIBO or hydrogen dominant SIBO or both. I have had all of them. And so and then it gets into, once you're diagnosed with one of those, it gets into like, there is kind of th different healing protocols for them. I mean, a lot of it's the same, but some of it's different. There's different antibiotics or herbals that can be used. And um, it's, it's a very, I think it's a very, very complex uh, intestinal overgrowth that is uh, hard for people to stay in remission from. And most people relapse and some, a lot of people like never even get out of it. Uh, and it's super complex, but yet my prediction is that the, the amount of people that are going to be diagnosed with it in the next few years is just going to skyrocket. Yeah. And I think I agree. It is getting better slightly over here with the diagnosis of SIBO. Certain gastroenterologists are aware of it. However, 
they don't usually promote the antibiotics or the herbal antibiotics even they kind of just I remember going to a gastroenterologist myself and I took my private SIBO test results and he kind of just um, he was aware of the condition but he said it's normal for everyone to have bacteria in their small intestines and it was normal to be bloated after eating your meals even when I explained that I'd never dealt with that in my life it was only a recent thing and I agree that we should have a certain degree of bacteria in the small intestine but it shouldn't be anywhere near like it is in the large intestine but uh, yeah <laughs> that is so hard because you know so here's the deal I had it so bad that I we tried I worked with a um, integrative practitioner at the Institute for Functional Medicine in California and we tried for about I don't know it was like six months or a year to go the herbal route that's what I really wanted um, but it just was not working and he's an integrative uh, practitioner and he said you're gonna need the antibiotic and I did and the thing is with the I, I don't think we need to be you know if, if you're skeptical or afraid of antibiotics I, I do think that this one's a little bit less worrisome for people because of the fact that it's like pretty localized to it doesn't like affect your entire um, immune system like a lot of antibiotics just pretty localized to the small intestine so there's that but so that's why I feel like it's it's a little bit unfortunate that we're hesitant to take that antibiotic. Um, and I'm, I'm always going to be a very strong advocate of it if the herb, herbal route doesn't work just because it's, it changed my life. And a lot of people do want to kind of push through and keep trying to go the natural routes just so they can avoid the antibiotics and conventional medication. But I think that's where people can kind of fall down in the fact that they are avoiding a medication that's really beneficial and it is it does act locally so it doesn't have all the other side effects of conventional treatments but I think we need to stay open-minded and ha kind of have a foot in both camps of the natural and conventional things because I, I say all the time if I was to get knocked down by a car then I would want to be taken to A&E in a hospital not to a herbalist totally yeah. <laughs> yeah I know it's so true and and that's why like I you know I say too I I'm always talking about how you can't diet harder you know so like there's a there's a time and a place for dieting and there's a time and a place for herbs and for medications and for oh by the way your lifestyle and how much you sleep and your stress and your water I mean there's a time and a place for everything and if we don't look at things super holistically and like incorporate things where and when they're appropriate it's really hard to heal for the long term yeah definitely I agree on that so back to kind of the diet approach that you like to take with gut healing you've mentioned the gaps protocol and the low fodmap diet are there any other kind of food strategies that you like to recommend are there certain things that you recommend avoiding completely I mean I have literally done and studied every single diet on the planet at this point. I mean, I've done everything from keto and gaps and specific carbohydrate diet to like a ton of carbohydrates and low fat. I mean, you name it, I've done it. At the Institute for Integrative Nutrition, we study a hundred different dietary theories, like even things like chickenitarian where people only eat chicken. Like it's just, <laughs> I, I, I am so well versed in all of them. And I will tell you exactly the diet that I follow today. It is called no diet. <laughs> and it's been, it's truly, it's truly changed my life. Um, however, I don't believe in that when you're first starting to heal, because I do think you need to be pretty careful with the things that you eat and the, the, what you're trying to like replenish your body and to be able to like absorb. Um, so back in the day, you know, I, I did a lot of gaps. I did a lot of meat, a lot of fat. I still believe in a lot of fat. However, these days I eat a lot less meat. That's like very, that's such a subjective thing in the healing world. But again, I have tried it all. I've lived it all. And right now that, is, that works for me because when I had to do gaps and low FODMAP, I could barely eat any vegetables and it drove me crazy. I was, I, I missed it so much. And now today that I can eat all of that, I eat so much fruits and vegetables and even grains. Well, I don't eat too much. You know, I'm, I'm, I, um, I don't keep it out of my diet for sure, but I don't like eat greens at every meal by any, by any means. I just like selectively have it when I'm really hungry for it. Usually like rice or quinoa. 
Um, but I, I lean more towards the vegetarian life now. I, things that I don't think in general are good for us to be consuming every single day all the time would be gluten and dairy and um, non-organic soy. I love tofu. I love miso, but I always eat it um, organic. Um, but just in general, I think everyone, as far as a diet is concerned, I think it's, it, it plays a big part in the initial part of your journey, but you need to know the diet that's exactly right for you because there is not one size fits all. In fact, even if there is one diet, like say, let's say the paleo diet is kind of the standard diet for initial gut healing. There are going to be foods on the paleo diet that you can have that I should not have. If you have, if I have SIBO and you don't, then there are certain foods that I can't have on paleo, but you can. So it gets like that. I think it gets that specific. And do you think it's possible for people on a vegan or vegetarian diet to heal the gut effectively and get rid of kind of bacterial infections or SIBO? Or do you think that the most effective diets are the GAPS, paleo and SCD diets that do contain quite a lot of meat? Well, I actually wrote a post on that called, Can You Heal Your Gut on a Vegetarian Diet? Have you read it? No, not yet. Oh, yes, I did. Um, because uh, last summer, fall, last fall, I heard Alicia Silverstone. I don't know if you know her because she's an American famous actress. I heard her speak and she has the kind diet and it's all, it's, she's vegan and it's all about that. And I just, I love her. I loved her take. I loved everything that she said about it. And so, you know, I just really started to explore this idea. Can you heal your gut on a vegetarian diet? Uh, because it didn't work for me initially. And even though I tried and I have women come to me every single day who say they're on a vegetarian or vegan diet and they feel miserable. So my answer to it and what I concluded was it depends what place of your journey you're on. So I really wanted to do it a long time ago when I was um, kind of first trying to heal SIBO and it didn't work for me. Because there just wasn't that, there wasn't that many things to eat. And I just, I didn't feel like I had enough energy and I stayed bloated and it just it really didn't work for me. However, if you're kind of like over that initial hump, I feel like you are able to like maintain good gut health by eating more of a vegetarian diet. Um, you know, I, I have like this internal battle with myself every day about eating animals and animal products. And, you know, I, I come from both sides because there's this side of me that doesn't want to eat any animal products at all. But then there's this other side of me that has done so much research and, so, and I've lived it. And so I know like, I'm, I also don't want to be like not eating and feeling horrible. So when I eat meat, it's very um, intentional. And I, source the best that I can. And I, I do not promote huge factory farms and, and that sort of thing. So for me, it comes down to this very moral issue combined with real forever healing. Um, and I think that along the journey of gut healing, if you really want to get better, you have to kind of keep an open mind about it and figure out what, what and how it can work best for you, a vegetarian or vegan diet. Mm -hmm. And in theory, the vegan diet the vegetarian diet sounds um, like perfect like we all live in this in this environment together and no one has to kill anything and we can all thrive on plant food however i agree in some cases the therapeutic benefits of the meat and the fact that it doesn't really feed bacterial overgrowth and it can be well tolerated for those with gut issues that's where you kind of have to maybe add some things in even if it's for a short period of time just while you get your gut better and then you can maintain on a more fibrous vegetarian or vegan diet because they are um, higher in carbs than some of the other things and yeah you might not be able to tolerate them straight away or you could maybe add in digestive enzymes and other things like that and when you clear the infections hopefully you'll be able to tolerate those things better right so exactly what would be something that you wish you knew from the get-go? As soon as your gut issues started, what would you wish that you had either in your back pocket or something that someone told you that would really benefit you from the beginning? Two things. 
One is when I didn't get better, my gut feeling initially upon the colitis diagnosis, my gut feeling told me this is not really what's plaguing me. This is not what's going on. And instead of really listening to my gut feeling and my gut intuition, I just tried to heal myself instead of getting more testing done, instead of trying to find what was really going on. And so I would stay miserable for several years until I got that SIBO diagnosis. So I guess how that can help you, whoever's listening, is if you still aren't feeling well after some kind of diagnosis and you don't actually think that that's what's wrong with you, don't stop. Like you have to keep getting further testing. You have to keep researching and you know, this is when Google and blogs can be your friend because you can find out, you know, other symptoms and you don't have to like start to become a hypochondriac, but you can like take note of different things and, you know, issues that you, that might be plaguing you and, and, um, continue to look into it and to research and get further testing. Um, because I could have saved myself so many years of pain and misery. Um, and just like the, the length of, that this is all taken. Um, and then the other thing I would say, honestly, I wish I, I wish I had known this or I wish I did know it. I just fought it for so long, but I wish I would have considered the lifestyle and mental aspect of this whole thing to be more of a serious thing from the beginning. It took me until this last year in a massive, like life changing event to finally like give in to this idea that I'm never going to heal my gut until I heal my life. And I had to, for me, that meant I had to like start talking to a therapist, you know, I had to make amends with people that I had hurt. I had to give up a lot of like clients and work stuff in order to make the extra space to be able to breathe and to figure out what's important to me. And I think that that's something that, you know, you, you can't get in the medication, you can't get in a diet book, you can't get on a blog, you can't get anywhere. But it's something that you have to absolutely start working on from the second you know that you're sick and something's wrong. I was just nodding all the way through that because I totally <laughs> agree in the fact that mental, emotional, psychological aspects are so important and they're often either overlooked completely or left till the very last thing that people address and only then do they start to see like amazing results and I've experienced it myself I was eating the best diet in the world taking all the supplements doing all the tests I knew what was wrong but until I addressed the kind of mental aspects and negative beliefs and thought patterns that I was having and speaking to a therapist that that's when my symptoms that really started to turn around and I really saw some difference so I'm so glad that you mentioned that it is so important and I think you know there's this stigma that like we can't like if we're you know caught talking to a therapist we, there must be something like massive going on in our lives and and it might be but it also might not be it might be just something as simple as you just want someone to have an outlet that's not going to give you a positive or negative bias in your life you know you just need like just that that person, you know, and I, there's no problem with, with it. And I, I, I can't recommend it enough. Like it's, it's seriously probably has absolutely changed my life. Yeah, me too. And even sometimes you don't want to maybe bother friends or families or put like negative energy onto them. So it's kind of having someone who's not in the situation just to talk to and just release your emotions to and definitely if something really bad's happened in your past or in your childhood then that really does need something to work through but it could just be maybe you don't think that you could get better maybe you've like myself I felt really restricted and excluded from my um, teenage years because I had all these health issues so I was kind of at home all the time and that really went into my psyche really in the fact that I was different things like that so it could just be little things you might not think that they're um, significant but they could definitely be playing a role and how long does it usually take for people to heal the guts completely so if they implement the diet if they find out what's wrong if they do the mental and emotional work how long can they expect to see differences in so if you do all of those things which is what I truly did this last year I think that within like six months you you can be like like I have been without zero issues. I'm going on a year now. Um, but that said, even still, I believe it's a lifelong journey. 
I think that at any moment, if you start to like do something that's like in reverse, you will feel the effects almost immediately. And so I, I believe it's a lifelong journey. I actually spoke with a really um, well-respected physician in the Bay Area when I lived in California, and he was diagnosed with SIBO. And he, he claims that there's no, well, there isn't, like there's no cure for it, there's no, and so even, even when we're feeling well, it's like there's, there's nothing that says that we can't relapse. So the thing is, I tell myself, I play these mind games every single day and I say, you're healed, you're well, your SIBO is gone. And I think that's very, very, very important that you continue to tell yourself that that's how long, you know, and you, you will keep getting better. So I think it can take anywhere from depending this, on the severity of it. But if you're, again, if you're doing all the things that you said, you have your appropriate diagnosis, you know, um, a few months to a couple of years, but then it's going to be a lifelong journey. Yeah. And the kind of common thing that happens is that people do one of those things. So they'll change the diet, and but then kind of not take on board everything else that I just mentioned. So yeah, I just wanted to kind of let people know that how quick things could turn around if they do put all these things into practice. Even though I say like two months, what I really mean by that too is if you have been like, if your stomach has been miserable, but you like really start to turn it around within a few days, your stomach, your physical symptoms can start to feel better. And I think that's very important for people to know because like people hear this oh my gosh, this is going to last me forever. Why would I even start doing anything right now? But the reality is that like literally when I started doing gaps within two days, and I've documented this on an old blogs, I've started to feel better. I was like, this is like a miracle. So you get, you can get immediate results once you know what's wrong and when you implement all the things. Yeah, definitely agree. And the body is really resilient. So when you find out what's going on and you provide it with the things that it needs and the building blocks to kind of repair and get better, then it can definitely turn around really quickly. It's really amazing. So I think that's a good time to kind of wrap things up with the interview. This has been so helpful. And like I mentioned, you're the first person we've had talking about gut health. I don't think this is going to be the last I'm going to be talking about this because the conversation could go on forever. But just to wrap up, there's just a few questions that I want to ask you personally. What is the one herb, supplement, or nutrient that you just cannot live without? L-glutamine. I love L-glutamine so much. I have been taking it for years now. Um, I, I just, I love it. I, I do believe that it really helps repair the gut lining, um, but it's also good for like muscle repair growth. So it's got like so many different things that's really great about it. Um, but in addition to that, I really love my HCL and my enzymes at certain times, my probiotic. And then any time I feel like I just maybe need a little bit of help, dysbiocide for SIBO. Um, and I, I barely take that anymore, but when I do, I take it for seven days and then I'm done and I'm like, like brand new again. So those are some of my favorites right now. Cool. Yeah. I wish I could tolerate L-glutamine, but it kind of gives me that um, brain migraine kind of symptoms. So I love all the benefits that it can um, mm -hmm. give to us. But for me personally, it doesn't work. And that's just another example of the individuality. So love totally. that. Yeah. So what's something that you're into lately? So this could be health related or non-health related. Um, well, like I said, I'm really into eating all the food and all the vegetables because after years and years of not doing it, I'm eating everything this week. I made chili and that's something that I haven't made because there's so many beans in it and it's freezing in Minnesota right now. So I had that. I mean, last night I had grilled cheese and tomato soup. I've been eating like Brussels sprouts and green beans and broccoli and cauliflower. I mean, it's just, I'm like super into food right now because I can eat everything. Um, and I'm also really into right now just honing in really hardcore on a gutsy girl. I'm going through a lot of changes with my brand right now, but it's so much fun and I love it. Everything's going to be moved to a new platform soon. Um, I am officially getting my trademark for the, the brand and I'm just really excited about 
the community that I'm building and all of the women that I'm connecting with that are, you know, gutsy, whether they're gutsy because of IBS, IBD, infertility, just anything, you know, like researching and helping women is my passion. Yeah. And I love the name of your website. So Mm -hmm. it's so amazing. And could you just let everyone else know where they can find you on Instagram and just your full website again, just so they've got that. Yeah. So it's a gutsy girl. G U T S Y a gutsy girl.com. And then I'm a gutsy girl on Instagram. I share posts like two to three times a day, tons of stories. Like I, I really try to keep me out of it. And I just try to provide as much, um, helpful IBS, IBD, infertility, skin, gut, mental information that I can, because again, I just, I really want to help. I don't want it to take you 10 years to heal like it did me. Um, So you can find me there. Those are like the two main places I'm at. And I really love to do a lot on Pinterest. I'm just, my name is Sarah K Hoffman. I'm that's, I'm Sarah K Hoffman on Pinterest because I think it's like a really great um, way for me to be able to share visual resources with people too, you know, in addition to Instagram, but I think there's, there's something different about Pinterest. So I I enjoy using that as well. Yeah, definitely recommend everyone goes and checks out your blog and your Instagram because you've probably covered so much information and it's all on there that you can look into and the yeah the visual posts that you do too you can print them out and keep them you can save them just to refer back to and i'll link to all of your um kind of social channels on the um, show notes as well cool lastly what's one piece of advice that you'd like everyone listening to take away from this whole entire interview the best piece of advice i think is that it sounds so cliche, but you can just never give up. Like you can never give up, whether it's your health, whether it's your business, whether it's like anything that is important to you, like never, ever give up on the idea around it. It's taken me 10 years to have a gutsy girl become what it is now. It's taken me 10 years to heal my gut. Like I don't hope, I don't wish that for anybody, but the point is that like, had I given up at any any point along this road, I would not be like as healthy and happy as I am today. Again, I know that, that people say that all the time, do not give up. But like, I I truly feel like I'm like the face of that. You know, one thing that we didn't even get into today is my whole infertility story, you know, and I, after going through like multiple inseminations and IVF and ending up in the emergency room and, you know, I could have given up on the whole idea of ever having children, but instead my husband and I like turned this awful thing into we adopted three children from the foster care system and I have these three beautiful amazing little you know little babies that we love and it's just that was that's I'm just so grateful that I never gave up on that either so yeah I'd love for you to come back on the podcast maybe in the future and discuss all of that your hormone journey um I want to thank you so much for being so open and sharing your health history and I want to thank you for all the information that you provide and all the education that you put out there into the world to help all these women thank you so much Sarah and yeah I'd love to have you back on the podcast in the future absolutely thanks so much thank you for listening to another episode of the hormones in harmony podcast if you like this episode please leave me a rating and review as this helps to spread the word to other women dealing with hormone imbalances As a massive thank you gift, I'll send you a free guide, Six Steps to Hormonal Harmony. All you need to do is screenshot your rating and review, then email it to me at hormonesinharmony at gmail.com and I'll send you the link to download this free guide. If you haven't already, check out my website vivanaturalhealth.co.uk and Instagram page at vivanaturalhealth for tons more free content and inspiration. You can also schedule a free 30 minute hormone troubleshooting call to find out the next steps to take in order to overcome your symptoms naturally. See you back here next week for another episode.